You know what? Let's skip all the nonsense and put the bottom line up front. Fastest random access? Pass in the whole M.2 drive using PCI pass-through. Fastest sequential access? Use a raw file type pointing directly to a partition. Easiest install, most flexibility, and most features? Use a QCOW2 image living on your file system. Don't know what any of that means? Stick around and it will all make sense very soon. Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Steve and this is Bland Man Studios, where I make creative stuff and talk about the technology behind it. Today we are picking up a series where I take apart and analyze the performance of gaming in a virtual machine. But don't worry, if this is the first video you've seen, you'll still be able to follow along. The series started with a video on gaming benchmarks, primarily focusing on frames per second. The idea was to compare a native or bare metal normal Windows 10 install to gaming the way I do it in a Windows 10 VM running on a Linux host. The second video took it one step further and looked at latency. The idea was to measure how long it takes to see a desired output on screen from a given input, like a mouse click or a button press. And in this video, we're going to answer the question, what type of virtual disk is fastest? The virtual disk is what your VM uses as a hard disk drive or solid state drive. Today, we're gonna to look at a few different types and see how they stack up against a native install. As usual, timestamps are in the description. Let's get started. So I spent a whole bunch of time setting up my computer with four different Windows installs. And the result was this beautiful data set and this beautiful graph. First, we're gonna talk about the different tests that were run, and then we're gonna dive into the different ways you can set up a virtual disk and how they stack up performance-wise. And there, we're gonna notice some pretty interesting patterns, so I think you're gonna to wanna to stick around. If you've seen my other videos, you know I've been using Crystal Disk Mark to measure disk speeds. There's not a particular reason why I've been using it other than that it was recommended to me and it's been pretty quick and easy to use. So that's actually the bulk of our tests here. In this glorious overall graph here, you can see the first eight clusters map directly to Crystal Disk Mark tests. It tests reads and writes, sequential and random access, and it varies up the number of cues it uses. I've been looking for a new tool that does disk speed testing and is cross-platform and open source. If you have a recommendation, please let me know in the comments. I tried a few out and ultimately decided to use FIO for a few more test cases. FIO is a flexible input-output tester designed to easily simulate a wide range of input-output workloads without needing to write a special program for each workload. I found an article online recommending some workloads that are meant to simulate the most common and most difficult tasks for a drive, so I tweaked them a bit and added them to the suite of tests I'm running. So what we have in total is all eight Crystal Disk Mark tests, four of which are sequential access and four are random access, and an additional four FIO tests that do random writes of various sizes using a differing number of threads. I ran each test on each configuration twice, so we can start to get an idea of how reliable and reproducible the test results are. And as you'll see later, that's enough for us to start picking up on some patterns. Okay, so if I learned anything about science from the Mythbusters, it's that you need a control group and you need your control group to be exactly the same as your test group, except for the one variable you're measuring. So I booted my PC up to a native Windows 10 install and ran the full test suite. But if you've seen my other videos, you know that I have an eight core CPU, and when I run a gaming VM, I only give six cores to the virtual machine. This way, the host operating system still has two cores for anything it needs to do. To control for this, I ran the tests again on the native install, this time with two CPU cores disabled. This will help us determine how much of the performance variation we're seeing is because of virtualization and the disk type, and how much is because we're running the VM with a smaller number of cores. And as you can see in this graph, there's not really a difference. In some cases, one is slightly faster, and in some cases, the other is. I expected maybe the 16 thread case would do better with more cores, but it didn't. And I guess this makes sense because the real bottleneck for each of these tests is accessing the drive, not CPU cycles. So from here, we have a good baseline to compare the virtual disk types. But this graph actually shows something that will be helpful to explain here. As I mentioned earlier, I ran each of these tests twice to demonstrate how much the results change between runs. 
So in these graphs, I colored the bottom bar with the lower value and the top bar with the higher value. For example, in this test, the first time I ran it, it scored around 1200 megabytes per second. And the second time, it scored almost twice that, around 2100 megabytes per second. So basically, the size of this top chunk helps us show a little bit about how reliable the test is. The smaller the chunk is, the more reproducible the, the test results are, because the two runs gave a very similar result. And that's why I'm pretty confident in concluding here that there's no real difference between running with 8 cores and 6 cores. There's almost more variation between two runs of the same test than between the two different configurations. So with that out of the way, we're ready to start testing virtual disk types. The first install we're going to test is the one installed to a QCOW2 image, and this is basically the easiest way you can set up a VM using QMU, KVM, and VFIO. If you're creating a VM using Vert Manager, this is the default option and it's the easiest to set up. Essentially, you have a file living on your host operating system's file system, and when the virtual machine thinks it's accessing a drive, it will actually be reading and writing from this file. And there are a lot of cool things you can do with QCOW2 files. For example, in this video, I show how you can back up your gaming VMs while they're running. But as for performance results, they're pretty shocking. This graph compares the QCOW2 VM to the native install with six cores. And in the sequential test, it's way faster. I believe this is because when Windows does a read or write to its drive, it's actually making a request to access that file and the actual interaction with hardware is done by Linux using its drivers, and I believe those drivers are doing a better job of caching what comes next. So when the next sequential request comes in, that data has already been fetched from storage and it's ready to be delivered to the benchmarking program. Unfortunately, I'm not ready to declare the VM a winner here. Sequential access is when your computer is reading or writing one big thing all in a row from beginning to end. A fast score here can be helpful for specific kinds of file processing, and it can make for flashy benchmark scores for disk manufacturers to put in their advertising. But in the real world, playing games or executing demanding workloads, your computer is more likely to be accessing storage randomly, because it doesn't know what you or your programs are going to be asking for next. And unfortunately for VFIO, the QCOW2 image did worse in the random access tests. But don't worry, there are performance gains to be had. The next file type is a raw image file. This is basically the same as the QCOW2 setup. It's still just a file that acts like a drive, and you can set it up the same way in Vert Manager. You sacrifice the advantages of the QCOW2 file, like the ability to snapshot disks or compress them. But with that sacrifice, it looks like you get a little performance boost in the random tests. I can zoom in on the crystal disk mark tests, specifically the random access tests, and the difference doesn't look huge. The real benefit of the raw file type is actually when we skip creating that file and point it directly to a partition with Windows installed. When we do that, we see a performance boost over both virtual file types, both in sequential and random access. Here's the crystal disk mark random access tests zoomed in. The reason we're seeing a performance improvement here is because we're skipping the overhead of the Linux file system. You might have heard of file systems like ext4, xfs, or zfs. The file system is the way all your files and folders are stored on disk. A file system is great for managing files, but it's not really designed for storing virtual machine disk images. You may have noticed that sometimes moving a huge file to a different folder on your computer is pretty fast. That's because the file doesn't actually get copied to a different place. The file system just has to change which directory is pointing to that file, which is actually stored at some random location on the drive. There's a little overhead for managing files, it's usually worth it for the benefits a file system gives, but since our virtual machine is managing its own set of folders, we can give it direct access to a partition and avoid the overhead of managing a file system inside another file system. I don't usually do this because I like to be able to grow, delete, and copy my virtual machine disk images without needing to mess with partition tables, but the performance gain is real, so it's there if you're interested in it. The last virtual disk type 
offers even more random access performance gains by sacrificing even more flexibility. On my system, I actually have two NVMe M.2 solid state drives, one with Windows installed and one with Fedora Linux installed. The Fedora install has everything needed to run high performance gaming VMs. And in this test, instead of using a virtual disk, I can actually pass in that other M.2 drive to the virtual machine using PCI pass-through, or VFIO. Since M.2 drives use PCI for communication, I'm actually passing the SSD in the same way I pass in the graphics card. The way it works is that the VM is using its hardware drivers to issue PCI commands, and it thinks it's talking directly to a PCI device, in this case the M.2 drive. But really, it's talking to the VFIO driver, which is running on Linux, which reads those commands and passes them along to the actual hardware. Because of the way this is done, the performance profile is basically just a slower version of the native install, as you can see here. It's good at the same things, and it's bad at the same things. And in everything it does, it's just a slower version of native. This is because the VFIO driver is acting as that middleman, and there is a bit of a performance penalty. So this is a bit trickier to set up, and it requires you to have at least two drives, one of which is an M.2 SSD. But if you're looking to squeeze out every last bit of real-world performance out of your gaming VM, PCI pass-through of a full M.2 drive is your winner. So with all that out of the way, I hope you can understand why I'm so proud of this graph, and I hope you have all the tools needed to interpret it yourself. Click the link in the description if you'd like to look at the raw testing data. If you're watching this video because you're beginning the journey of setting up gaming virtual machines for yourself, or looking for ways to improve performance of your system, I'm very excited for you. As usual, if you have feedback on things you'd like to see, or ways to improve these tests, let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to stay bland.